Thank you, Randy. And you can see my slides, is that correct? Yeah, it looks good. All right, sounds good. Yeah, thank you to uh, Central Region for hosting the symposium. And uh, it's great to be here with Ray on behalf of the TWIP. Um, I'll be giving the bulk of the presentation today, but Ray will be joining for the Q&A session. Uh, as one of the newcomers to the group, he, I may not have uh, quite as good an answer as he would to some of your questions. So uh, he'll be joining and helping out with that. So just as some background, uh, the Tornado Warning Improvement Project was formed to develop and deliver an expert level continuing education curriculum for tornado warning decision making. And this vision, along with the team itself, uh, was crafted in response to differences in tornado warning POD and FA, FAR uh, across Central Region. So these differences largely stem from variations in training and continuing education following RAC or previously the DLOC. And there may also be some cultural or philosophical differences from office to office that contribute to some of these uh, differences we see in the warning statistics. So in support of this mission, the TWIP has produced many different deliverables that can be used at various stages of that training and continuing education process. So these include uh, several modules and webinars, in addition, separate curricula specifically for QLCSs versus supercells. Reference sheets that can be used just as a quick refresher. A QLCS West case that's going to be required training here in the next year or so. And also the radar feature catalogs, which is what we'll primarily be discussing today. And these radar feature catalog entries provide several bite sized examples of radar features in QLCSs or supercells that could be used to instill confidence and build expertise in the tornado warning decision process through both the explanation and application of these features and also just pattern recognition in general. So you can find TWIP materials uh, on our Google site and also our VLAB page. Links to both of these are shown here and I'm gonna be showing each of these pages uh, shortly in a browser, but I did wanna provide the links as well just for future reference. You can also find a link to the TWIP page on the CRH Science and Technology Integration homepage under the Science and Operations pull-down menu there along the top. So when you go to the TWIP Google site, uh, this is the front page that's going to be greeting you. As you can see, the Radar Feature Catalogs tab is, is shown right along the top of the page there, along with several other tabs. So I'm going to jump over to the browser here so we can take a look at that page. Here again uh, is the home page for the TWIP website. Uh, if you want to click on the Radar Feature Catalogs tab, that'll bring you um, to the different categories we have for QLCSs and supercells. We also have a section down here for different velocity contamination signatures, uh, which can sometimes give the false impression of a, a strong couplet um, that isn't actually there. So if we're interested in a particular signature, Let's say that uh, we'd like a refresher on sending rear and flow jets and reflectivity drops. You can click on that appropriate category and that's gonna bring up all of the different entries that we have for that category. Each of these is gonna have a bottom line up front type of image, um, which will show an example of the radar feature. And you see it's annotated here, so reflectivity drop in this particular case. All the entries are also either going to have a narrated video, as you can see this example here, or an animation. And these will show the development and evolution of the feature in that particular case. GR2 radar data are also available for each case, so folks can go back through the case at their own pace and analyze radar imagery beyond what's just shown here uh, for further context. And finally, there's a screen capture of the different uh, tornado tracks from the event. In this case, there were just one. Um, some of these, you'll have multiple different tornado tracks. And uh, I'll also say that each of the events has its unique case description, just a little paragraph talking about what the environment was like and a general overview of the event. Now note that reviewing each of these radar feature catalog entries, um, at least in terms of the narrated or narrated videos or animations is gonna be required spring training for the region this year. 
So going back to that main page, you can see there's quite a bit to uh, choose from and chew on in terms of the radar feature catalogs. Uh, a lot of good examples in this instance of tornadic debris signatures. And if you wanted to look uh, at just what we have for the supercells here, have a lot of good examples of ZDR arcs. Um, and there is a new uh, supercell reference sheet as well that just came out that you can use in conjunction with these radar feature catalogs to get a better idea of how to apply uh, some of these features in real cases. So taking a quick look um, at the VLAB page here, we, we again see that the radar feature catalog link is available on the main page. This time it's gonna be along the right side of the screen. And if we go over to our browser, just to take a look at that, uh, ultimately all of the same information and items are provided on the VLAB page. So if you look at the radar feature catalog link again, um, everything here is available uh, on the Google site as well. It's just kind of whichever you prefer to look at. Um, just a slightly different format, but if you click again on the descending rear inflow jet and reflectivity drop page here, you see the same examples um, with all the same information available. Now, I did want to point out on the Google sites um, before I jump back to the, the presentation here, there is an option uh, for contact information along the top of the page here. There is a way that you can email the entire team. You can also email any of us individually. Um, this is a good opportunity or way to provide example cases to us or make recommendations to the team. You can also request uh, custom webinars based on an event that occurred in your area. Jason and I actually gave one of these to, to a WFO uh, earlier this week. Basically, if you want the, the TWIP team to go through a prior case that affected your area, point out some of the, the key features, uh, provide an example of the Mesovortex warning system. We can do any anything like that uh, at your request. So we're happy to help out. Just feel free to reach out. So with the radar feature catalogs in mind, I did want to provide a quick example from one of these cases showing how the QLCS Mesovortex warning system can be used to improve confidence in the issuance of a tornado warning and possibly also gain some lead time. So the case that we're gonna be looking at today is from the afternoon of March 19th, 2020 in Paducah CWA. So you might be, you might remember seeing that reference sheet at right in the TWIP materials in the past. Um, in essence, this QLCS Mesovortex warning system relies on the three ingredients method and the associated confidence builders and nudgers. So, Recall that the three ingredients that we're seeking in terms of a QLCS are a balanced or slightly shear dominant updraft downdraft convergence zone, line normal zero to three kilometer bulk shear magnitude of at least 30 knots, and also a localized surge or bow within the QLCS. So while I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, uh, I did want to briefly discuss the environment particularly because some environmental variables are referenced in the three ingredients method and also one of those associated nudgers. And I do want to thank Rich Thompson as well from the SPC for providing these archived mesoanalysis images to us. So the MLK Piro is about 500 to 1,000 joules per kilogram. Uh, the effective shear was fairly strong, about 45 to 55 knots. Zero to three kilometer uh, shear vector magnitude was about 40 to 50 knots. Um, so it's pretty impressive. And note that the vectors were generally pointed toward the east northeast in this situation. So bowing or surging toward that direction uh, would be able to take full advantage of that mid level shear. Additionally, mu cape was similar to mixed layer cape. So convection was likely surface based in this situation. And meanwhile, the low level cape or zero to three kilometer cape was about 50 to 75 joules per kilogram. So taking that all together, we're dealing with a generally low to moderate cape and high shear environment. The zero to three kilometer shear vector magnitude threshold 
of 30 knots in that three ingredients method would be pretty easily met um, with a variety of bowing orientations towards the, the east and northeast. And finally, that zero to three kilometer cape nudger threshold of 40 joules per kilogram is also exceeded in this situation. So the environment does look pretty favorable for the potential of mesovortex gen genesis and potentially tornado genesis as well. So in this case, we have a relatively short uh, QLCS oriented, oriented from southwest to northeast, and it's moving from west to east across southeastern Missouri and southern Illinois. The nearest radar in this case is about 60 to 70 nautical miles away to the southeast. It's a Paducah radar. So we're looking at around five to 7,000 feet above radar level. But if we plot an approximate location of the updraft downdraft convergence zone here, we see that the QLCS is largely balanced to slightly shear dominant in some portions of the QLCS. Additionally, just south of Steelville here, we see the updraft downdraft convergence zone curves back toward the convection. This transition from a balanced regime farther south to more of a shear dominant regime farther north is what's known as an entry point, and that's one of our confidence builders. Note that uh, there also appears to be an area of embedded rotation, or at least enhanced inbounds and convergence to the east of Chester here in roughly the same location. So in context of the mesovortex warning system, uh, we're in pretty good shape already. We have at least two ingredients of the three ingredients method met, along with at least one confidence builder and one nudger. So let's move forward now and see what changes. So as we move forward over the next several scans, we're going to begin to see some subtle surging in reflectivity in that same portion of the line that I referenced before, with reflectivity decreasing on the back side of the line. So you can see that reflectivity starting to drop out a little bit there on uh, to the southeast of Steelville on the back side of the QLCS. You also see a little bit of surging in reflectivity there. So revisiting that mesovortex warning system document, with that surge or bow that is developing, all three ingredients are now met. Additionally, this appears to be an enhancing surge or bow just based on the radar trends that we're seeing associated with a reflectivity drop. So we now have um, four confidence builders and nudgers. So at the least, using the guidance at the bottom left here of the document, this would suggest that a severe thunderstorm warning with a tornado possible tag is justified, and possibly at this point, even a tornado warning. So let's keep moving forward and see how things continue to evolve. So at this point, uh, there's pretty clear reflectivity drop north of Ava in the vicinity of that pre-existing rotation. And note the S-shaped reflectivity structure here. This type of ra uh, radar reflectivity feature is observed pretty frequently in higher shear and lower cape environments. And this can sometimes produce tornadoes around the time or just after a break appears in the line. These are called broken S signatures. And as we continue to step forward, that reflectivity drop becomes even more pronounced to the north of Ava. Eventually, we get a break in higher reflectivity values entirely as you see here. So note that with a broken S signature as well, the, the break often occurs in a top-down fashion. So since we're looking at approximately 6,000 feet above radar level in this situation, the break in this case uh, might also provide some lead time for potential tornado development. So at this point, with a line break in mind, we have five confidence builders and nudgers. The three ingredients are met. So we're pretty comfortably within that tornado warning issuance zone at this point. Now as we move forward, note that there is a pretty clear persistent separation between the northern and uh, southern areas of higher reflectivity here. I'll just step through a couple more radar volume scans. And at this point, in addition to that uh, line break, note that we're starting to see a slight uptick of inbound velocities just to the east of Pinckneyville 
as well. Eventually, a brief tornado does occur in this zone, uh, just to the east of Pinckneyville, close to the southern end of that northern line of reflectivity. Because we're far from radar in this case, the couplet doesn't look especially tight or strong, but more than likely, given that the QLCS mesovortices do tend to be pretty shallow, uh, the radar is probably overshooting the bulk of the rotation in this case. So this was certainly a, a challenging case, given the low to moderate CAPE environment and the distance from radar. But you can see here, by using the mesovortex warning system, we could have possibly gotten at least 10 to 12 minutes of lead time and potentially as much as 20 to 25 minutes lead time, depending on the threshold for confidence builders and nudgers. And I will say that the Paducah office did well in this case. Uh, they, they did have a tornado warning out and got some lead time in this situation. So just to wrap up, I'm gonna leave the links to our Google site and VLAB pages here. And for the SUs out there, uh, you might be considering how these radar feature catalogs could be used in your training. In, take, in uh, talking with Ray, he had some great suggestions to, to how you could do that. Um, your more experienced forecasters could go through the catalog on their own at a self-guided pace. On the other hand, for your less experienced forecasters, you could either walk through the catalog with them one-on-one uh, -on -one or in groups, depending on uh, how you prefer to do that at, at your office, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page at the same skill level. So. If you'd like to follow up, my email address and Ray's uh, are both provided below. And you can also provide, you can also find those, that contact information for the entire team, as I mentioned, on our, on our websites. So thank you for your attention and we're happy to take any questions you might have at this time.